So good morning or afternoon or evening, depending on when you are tuning in to this special uh, one hour uh, version of the USALI speaker series. Uh, this is our, the last event in our academic year of 2020, uh, 2021. We will now go on a short hiatus for the month of August. Uh, we will be back with weekly speakers starting in uh, mid-September. Uh, I want to particularly welcome to this session the incoming members of the LLM class uh, in International Legal Studies who received a special invite uh, for this. And, and uh, I hope that they see this as an introduction to not just what USALI does, but to many events at the law school that will enrich their law school experience. Um, it's also this event coincides roughly with the one year mark uh, where I assume the faculty directorship of uh, USALI here at NYU. Uh, as all of you know, uh, Jerry Cohen is, uh, is very much active. Uh, he's probably watching right now, uh, so he has not stepped away. Uh, and uh, there is no way that anyone can fill his, his shoes. Uh, but I have learned quite a bit uh, in uh, this one year time. And one of the things I've learned is that it takes a village to put on uh, this speaker series and all the great work that USALI uh, does year in, year out, including programs on criminal law reform in Asia, uh, conferences apart from the speaker series, uh, the perspective series that, uh, that uh, some of you, I hope, read uh, of 1,000 word essays. Uh, Part of that village uh, is listening in today, and I want to take time to thank them. Alexis Sanborn, uh, who puts the, uh, these programs together, uh, who will, uh, alas, be leaving us for greener pastures at the end of this month, and, and uh, we still don't know how we're going to uh, replace her. Um, and of course, uh, Catherine Wilhelm, our executive director. Um, there are lots of other people uh, to thank, including uh, uh, folks, uh, for example, who uh, helped to put this program together today. So among those is USALI advisor uh, Ron Ito, who not only proposed the topic, but went a step further and suggested who would be the ideal people, as you'll see, uh, to address them, the two speakers that we have today. We're very grateful uh, for Ren uh, for doing that to us. The, the one thing I also wanna take the time to do right now is to suggest to all of you, many of you have been uh, listening in to our speaker series, either live or in the recordings that are of course available on our website shortly after each event. Uh, to keep ideas coming to us. Send ideas of topics, uh, speakers. Uh, if you'd like to send them me personally, uh, Jose Period Alvarez at nyu.edu. We very much appreciate uh, people from the field telling us, uh, especially for example, if you read something in Chinese, Japanese, another uh, language that you think uh, a US audience uh, would, uh, would benefit from knowing and you're in a position to talk to the author or to yourself, uh, help uh, translate with the cooperation of the publisher and author, let us know about that. Uh, because some of uh, the most uh, viewed uh, postings on our website include uh, articles uh, that have first appeared in some other uh, language, uh, but otherwise would not be accessible uh, to folks in the US, which sadly, as you know, uh, are mostly monolingual, uh, unless uh, unlike the folks who are uh, talking to us today and much of the planet. So, um, so that's just by way of introduction and deep thanks uh, to all the folks that make these programs possible. So today's topic is on global trade flows uh, and global supply chains. And as many of you who've been attending these programs or just reading uh, the paper know, uh, much of that uh, now goes through Asia and involves uh, the great powers in Asia, including Japan uh, and China, of course. Uh, and those of you who follow legal issues on this will know that many of the most prominent uh, trade agreements and investment agreements and both are now uh, have 
a great deal to do with Asian countries. We're talking about the Singapore Convention on Mediation, the EU-China Investment Agreement, the ASEAN Co uh, Comprehensive Investment Agreement and all the bilateral agreements that are inspired by it, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership or RCEP, uh, the EU-Vietnam, EU-Singapore uh, respective agreements that include the innovation of a multilateral uh, investment court the Progressive and Comprehensive Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, that now uh, is abbreviated in most circles to TPP-11 because of the 11 countries that are participating in it once the US, uh, the Trump administration left. Uh, and, um, and I think that suggests just the great significance of a trade. And, uh, and also I think you will hear from our participants how we need to think about trade uh, as something other than the, the classic trade in goods. Uh, and I think Asia is at the forefront of that. So let me uh, not take too much time and just uh, briefly introduce the speakers in the order that you will uh, hear from them. Ambassador Koji Soshiroka served the Japanese government for 43 years. Uh, his last posting was as ambassador to the UK from 2016 to 2019. Prior to that appointment, he was the chief negotiator for that Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement that I just mentioned. Uh, he was the deputy foreign minister and personal representative of uh, Prime Minister Abe at the G8 and G20 summits. His expertise includes, of course, trade and public international law. And that public international law includes representing Japan in the famous whaling case at the ICJ uh, that many uh, of our students certainly study. In trade issues, he was the chief negotiator for the services trade in Uruguay round uh, and the drafting of the general agreement on trade in services, the GATS. Uh, in, in short, he's done everything that many of you would dream of doing if you are students and want to be uh, a public international lawyer. He's represented Japan at many UN conferences and agencies, including uh, UNDP and UNICEF. He has served on diplomatic negotiations, including the UN Conference on Climate Change uh, and APEC meetings. He's a graduate of the Tokyo University Law Faculty, has an LLM uh, from Harvard Law School, uh, and he is now currently president of the International Affairs Research Institute, a think tank advising the Japanese government. He will be followed by Glenn Fuki, uh, Fukushima, who's a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress, a Washington DC think tank. From 1990 to uh, 2012, he was the senior executive based in Asia with one European and four American multilateral corporations and was elected president of the American Chamber of Commerce in Japan. From 1985 to 1990, he served in uh, the administration as director for Japanese affairs and the deputy assistant US trade representative from Japan and China from 1988 to 1990 at the USTR. Uh, and he has served on numerous corporate boards and government advisory councils in the US, Europe, and Japan. His publications include The Politics of US-Japan Economic Friction, and he was educated at Stanford University, Harvard Business School, then the Harvard Law School. He's been a Fulbright Fellow at the University of Tokyo. You can't get uh, two more well-informed people uh, to talk about this. I think what we can expect is rather uh, not uh, disagreeing perspectives, but different takes. And so I think the ambassador will first give us some uh, historical overview of US-Japan relations. And then uh, Glenn will, uh, will address what to expect from the Biden administration and why the structural reasons uh, for that. Uh, I've had the benefit of hearing both of them pretty much give these talks so I can anticipate that that is, but I will always be surprised, I think, by what you hear. After the two brief presentations, we hope to have time for an exchange uh, uh, between them, but also I encourage anyone uh, listening in uh, as you listen in to type in your questions at the Q&A box, and I will be uh, looking at them and post uh, them hopefully in the last uh, 15 to 20 minutes uh, to the extent we have time, we will end promptly in one hour. So Ambassador, your turn. Thank you, Professor Alvarez, uh, uh, very kind uh, introduction. 
since time is short, I will jump into uh, issues that I believe uh, uh, relevant for uh, this forum and very important, uh, not just bilaterally uh, with Japan and the US, but uh, for the global economy. I have been dealing with the uh, trade issues for the last uh, 30 plus years and uh, have uh, uh, experienced a number of uh, very difficult negotiations bilaterally and multilaterally. Uh, those were, in most, of, most of them uh, related to what was called trade friction, trade friction, meaning confrontational discussion on how you could reduce the trade imbalance. Well, today the world is moving much faster and then away from those traditional trade talks because the global economy is intertwined and the global supply chain, which the professor just mentioned, uh, has been created very widely and broadly and no country can continue to produce anything on its own or alone. And therefore, the uh, linkages that have been created over the past 20 to 30 years have transformed the nature of global trade. The Japanese investment in US, for example, has now surpassed in terms of the stock that of UK, which has been the largest investor uh, abroad to US over the last uh, 200 years. But now Japan ranks top and is creating about a million uh, jobs through those investments. That really identifies how closely and how unified the two economies have become today, but it is in the background of, of global uh, a supply chain and uh, interaction. Now, what is going to be very crucial to continue to prosper? Well, just like a human being cannot live without uh, uh, a bloodline, the bloodline today is data. It is the digital economy that is going to lead and become the engine that promotes further growth. We don't have a universal rule on how you address data transfer, data security, or how you make certain that private companies will feel confident to employ those digital means to conduct cross-border businesses. Uh, it's a bit unfortunate. Well, between Japan and US, we have an agreement on the digital economy, which I believe is high quality, but that's only limited to Japan and the US. That has to be universalized. The task for the two leading uh, economies that uh, have continued to perform well on the basis of free market economy and free trade is now for the two countries to promote those well-established and far-reaching uh, digital economy to the rest of the world so that all economies will uh, be able to prosper as well as both Japan and US by engaging the rest of the world. We know EU has a scheme that protects their data, uh, mostly from the privacy perspective, which is, of course, legitimate. Uh, but that discussion is now uh, undertaken in the WTO setting, but it is not progressing well. It's a bit sad to uh, mention that uh, although WTO is the forum to do universality in terms of trade promotion, it is not functioning quite well. What do we, Japan and US, have to do? It is for us to join forces to make certain that we promote global good. And to do that, the soft infrastructure, which is going to remove and move away from the 19th century trade mind into the 21st century, looking at the high tech economic security, as well as promoting goods and data that is going to benefit individuals and even small and medium sized country, companies. Thank you. I will just stop here and then we'll be happy to engage later. Great. So, Glenn? Glenn, your turn. Yes. Uh, I, am I uh, on? Yes. Yes, you are. Okay, fine. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jose, for uh, inviting me to the uh, USALI program and for uh, the kind introduction. Uh, I want to first 
uh, begin by saying that uh, this is a real privilege because uh, Jerry Cohen was uh, the person at Harvard Law School in the 1970s when I was a student at Harvard who encouraged me to go to law school at Harvard. And also <clears throat> Ren Ito, who you mentioned, it has been a friend for many years. So I'm very pleased to participate. Uh, also Koji Suroka is someone I also met uh, for the first time in the 1970s at Harvard Law School. So it's Len, kind of if cool. I can interrupt, can you turn on your camera? Well, I tried and I can't, oh, there it is. Okay, yes. fine. Great, I tried several times I couldn't <laughs> turn it on. All right, thank you. So um, <clears throat> what I'm going to do is uh, talk uh, for about 10 minutes uh, on three topics. The first topic is the changes in uh, US trade policy from the uh, previous administration, the Trump administration to the <clears throat> Biden administration. Secondly, uh, talk about differences between the Obama administration and the uh, Biden administration on trade. And then thirdly, talk more specifically about uh, US-Japan trade and uh, what we can expect over the next uh, four years at least. Uh, first, with regard to the uh, differences between the uh, Trump administration and Biden administration's trade policy, it's only been six months in this administration and frankly, trade has not been a front burner issue. So uh, there hasn't been a lot of action yet. There's been a lot of rhetoric, not yet a lot of action. In fact, uh, Bob Zelig, who had been US trade representative a number of years ago, uh, recently had an op-ed piece in the Wall Street Journal in which he argued that uh, although he agrees in general with the Biden uh, global agenda, that he feels that uh, trade policy is the missing link in the um, uh, Biden administration's uh, global strategy. So I think we still need to, uh, to, um, to wait and see exactly what's going to happen. But I think we can draw several uh, tentative conclusions. Uh, the first is that the uh, previous administration focused very much on bilateral uh, trade, whereas the Biden uh, people uh, want to focus more on multilateral trade. Um, I think uh, the approach to Japan is uh, reflected in part in the Quad, which, uh, as you know, includes not only Japan, but also Australia and um, India, and also other like-minded countries that are cooperating. So that's the first difference. The second, I think, is the Biden people are more focused, focused on the quality of the trade, uh, whereas the, the, the Trump administration, and, and in particular, President Trump, was really, very much focused on bilateral uh, trade deficits. And that was the, the focus that he had, especially with China and other countries such as Mexico and Germany, et cetera. The third is that I think uh, this administration is more interested in working closely with allies, whereas the previous administration uh, sometimes felt that allies really were taking advantage of the United States. Um, and uh, certainly the, the president expressed that uh, in his um, uh, discussions about uh, the EU. Uh, sometimes uh, about Japan as well as about uh, South Korea. Um, <clears throat> another and I think fourth uh, difference is that there is, um, I think, more of a <clears throat> coherent or systematic approach to trade uh, in this administration, at least the rhetoric so far has been, uh, as opposed to more of, a, I think, an ad hoc and sometimes reactive <clears throat> approach that the previous administration had. Now, secondly, with regard to <clears throat> the um, current administration's approach to trade versus the Obama administration. <clears throat> and I think it's important to discuss this because many people believe that because um, President Biden was the vice president during the eight years of the Obama administration, that this would be a natural continuation uh, in trade and other issues uh, from uh, four years ago or five years ago. Uh, I think actually there are some <clears throat> major differences, especially when it comes to trade. And I can think of two in particular. I think one is on China. Uh, it's very clear that this administration considers China and not only in trade, but more generally to be the largest single uh, issue uh, or challenge that the United States faces internationally. And so therefore there's a, a tremendous amount of interest and focus uh, on, on China. And um, <clears throat> whereas the, the, I think Obama administration uh, tended to focus on China to engage with China and to in many ways try to cooperate with China, hoping that by having uh, greater uh, trade investment, uh, student exchanges and so forth, that this would help to uh, open up China, to make China a more democratic uh, society, that um, that view has been uh, significantly uh, moderated, I would say. And in fact, I think now the current administration's view on China is that there are three ways uh, to engage with China. Uh, the first is um, uh, competition, uh, especially uh, with regard to the economy. The second is uh, uh, confrontation 
uh, with regard to issues like human rights and uh, security issues. And the third is cooperation, where it uh, is, a ben is beneficial to the United States. And the uh, areas that are often mentioned are climate change, uh, nuclear non-proliferation, and pandemics. So I think that's one major area of change in China. The second uh, major area of change I see is that this administration is very focused on the domestic uh, economy and the domestic uh, politics and its relation to foreign policy and including especially trade policy. Um, as many of you know, in September of last year, the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace issued a uh, report called uh, Foreign Policy for the Middle Class. And uh, this report, which looked into uh, Colorado, Nebraska, and Ohio in, in detail, and investigated what the American, the heartland of America, uh, the, and the American middle class and working class, what they expect from uh, Americans' engagement with the world. And uh, what's I think significant is that uh, at least uh, two of the participants in this study, Jake Sullivan, uh, head of the uh, National Security Council, uh, and also uh, Salman Ahmed, who is the uh, head of policy planning at State Department, uh, these two people who are in very important positions in the current administration were part of that study. And I think that my own interpretation is that that study is uh, partly a reflection of uh, analyzing what led to the defeat of Democrats in 2016. The fact that uh, there was not enough attention being paid to the middle class and the working class, and especially in the heartland of America, where uh, uh, Hillary Clinton lost many of the uh, states that she thought she was gonna get, such as Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. And uh, so the, I think the notion that uh, actually something that uh, Larry Summers, uh, the former Secretary of Treasury mentioned in an op-ed piece he had in the Financial Times and the Washington Post way back in uh, June of 2016, right after Brexit, in which he argued that uh, rather than a reflexive uh, globalism, that uh, leaders are going to be expected to focus first and foremost on their constituents and their um, uh, citizens. Uh, and I think that is one of the major themes of this administration, that uh, foreign policy has to be uh, of benefit to Americans. And uh, Catherine Tai, the US trade representative, has repeatedly uh, mentioned that uh, the US trade policy must be uh, to the advantage of uh, uh, workers in the middle class. And uh, just yesterday, I was at a Zoom program uh, that uh, included uh, precisely this issue of uh, labor and uh, and the uh, and trade policy. So I think that's a, those are the two: uh, the China and uh, the focus on domestic uh, economy are two, I think, significant uh, uh, changes from the uh, the Obama administration. <clears throat> Thirdly, with regard to U.S.-Japan trade, uh, as Koji mentioned in his uh, opening remarks. It's very true that when I was at USTR back in the 1980s, uh, it was really bilateral trade friction and the market access issues. Um, and, um, uh, but that has, I think by the 19, I'd say by 1995, after the settlement in Geneva between Miki Cantor, the then US trade representative and Yutaro Hashimoto, then the MITI minister uh, on autos and auto parts. With that 1995 June agreement, I think we kind of moved on uh, beyond bilateral trade frictions and now really, I, I think what I see, and especially having spent those 22 years in business in Japan and being president of the American Chamber, my observation is that those American companies that are operating in Japan and have been successful are very happy and they're not complaining. Those companies that tried to get in and were unsuccessful have given up and they've gone elsewhere. Uh, and I think they, these companies, some of them felt that Japan was too difficult to get into or uh, that the uh, growth of the market in Japan was not as significant as in China or even South Korea or other countries. During the Clinton administration, as you know, there was the, the 10 BEMs, the big emerging markets. And in Asia, those were identified to be China, South Korea, Indonesia, and India. So partly because of the demographics in Japan and Japan's shrinking population uh, and so forth, I think that uh, some com companies, American companies, have decided to go elsewhere. So there really isn't very much right now in terms of uh, major US-Japan trade uh, conflicts. In fact, I think that what we see now uh, is uh, an, uh, uh, the, uh, the hope and the expectation that uh, the US and Japan can cooperate and cooperating uh, because these are the two, uh, number one and number three uh, economies and Japan still remains uh, the, um, uh, the largest uh, uh, e democratic economy in, in Asia. 
And uh, therefore, there are many areas of uh, potential cooperation, uh, such uh, as um, uh, some calls for an FTA, uh, and also uh, the um, uh, digital trade area that Koji has mentioned. Another element, and this is tied to my second point about changes in the administration's approach, is that because of China being such a major issue for both the United States and Japan, uh, with regard to issues like uh, supply chain, critical technology, cybersecurity, uh, and, and so forth, uh, I think the, the opportunities for the U.S. and Japan to cooperate uh, have um, uh, become much greater than in the past. And when Prime, Prime Minister Suga visited Washington, D.C. in April of this year, met with President Biden, uh, the joint statement that came out later included quite a bit in terms of areas of cooperation, potential cooperation between the U.S. and Japan. Uh, now, Finally, I guess I would say that uh, I know there are many in Japan and others in Asia who are hoping that the U.S. will re-engage and rejoin the, the TPP or the TPP-11 or the CPTPP. Um, and I think the likelihood of that in the near future is not very high, uh, mainly because of the reasons I mentioned in my second uh, part about the focus on the domestic uh, front in the United States and, and benefits for uh, the middle class and the working class uh, with regard to trade policy. Um, but also, I think there are three, three uh, this is my last point, but there are, I think, three views on this issue of the TPP right now in the United States. One view uh, held by many economists and uh, some in the business community believe that it's a huge setback for the United States to have withdrawn from TPP as President Trump did on his first uh, official day in office as president, and therefore we should re-engage. The kind of the opposite view is that um, because something like a TPP will require considerable efforts to negotiate, first of all, with 11 countries, and soon Britain, I think, may join, so 11 or 12 countries. And then secondly, to get the domestic uh, consensus, uh, especially in the Congress, to get that through, is going to be, uh, it's going to take time. It's going to take a lot of political capital. And given the uh, long-term benefits, but not necessarily short-term benefits of something like a TPP versus the short-term investment that's required of political capital, that it just doesn't make sense in the short term to do this. Uh, perhaps in the longer term, it's possible, but not immediately. Um, so that's the other, uh, the other extreme. In between is the view that, well, it may be true that it's premature to engage in a whole-scale uh, trade uh, agreement negotiation like a TPP or CPTPP. However, it may be possible to pursue a more narrowly focused uh, trade agenda in Asia that's multilateral. And that's where this issue of digital trade comes in that Koji mentioned, where uh, it, many make the argument that the United States and Japan and certain other like-minded countries in the region could engage in something like a digital uh, negotiation, which would be less onerous, take less time and require less political capital and produce some pretty positive results. So. That is the, I think, debate right now. That's this kind of middle ground. But as you may have seen in yesterday's Wall Street Journal, uh, there appears to be some differences within the administration uh, on precisely this issue of uh, to what extent a digital trade uh, agreement should be pursued in Asia. Uh, and so uh, things are a little uncertain yet, but I think that's kind of the general outlines as I see it. Uh, but within the, between the US and Japan, I certainly see uh, areas of cooperation uh, going forward, especially with China in mind. So I'll close my opening comments here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, and I appreciate both of you staying within your time limits. Uh, so let me open up the discussion and I encourage those of you who are watching to add your own questions that I will turn to uh, as I see them appear uh, under the Q&A box. So be sure to type them in, you'll see at the bottom of your screen. So I'll go to the ambassador uh, to ask you to react to anything you have heard uh, Glenn uh, discuss. Uh, I'm particularly interested in uh, your views, but you don't have to uh, stay there, on how he described the Biden administration's uh, thinking about China. Uh, and, and especially uh, the idea that uh, when the administration thinks about trade, China is the first thing that they think about. Um, is that a wise thing to do? And, and how do you think the uh, both countries, both US and Japan ought to think about China? Ambassador. Uh, your mic, you're muted. Sorry, sorry. 
Uh, yes, uh, I, I didn't uh, name any country in my uh, initial um, uh, announce, uh, statement, but China uh, is always uh, the central player whenever we have international discussions or even domestic politics, because they are looming and then sometimes uh, invisibly engaging uh, with uh, the democratic world. Uh, we just saw a, a joint announcement by the democratic nations on the cyber attack that comes from Chinese territory, for example. And of course, they say they, they don't do it and they have nothing to do with it. That's a, a very interesting uh, response, I believe, because they know everything and they've been able to control everything. And that's how they survived the pandemic. And now when we say don't let the, perhaps it's not uh, state controlled or state initiated attacks, but they certainly should be aware, given the control they have over all the uh, interaction through the digital economy. But uh, that uh, is really a threat that uh, we need to uh, be wary about. And therefore, it is not just in terms of trade, uh, the typical uh, problematic trade as seen in the trade imbalance, but it is a lot much more important and dangerous uh, difference that uh, will affect the basic structure of any country's economy that we rely on, on the free economy based on rules, transparency uh, by law, it will be predictable. If there is any conflict, there will be fair resolution that will be acceptable to all. These are all elements that uh, have been taken for granted that are the basis for the global and domestic prosperity. Now, if countries reject those systems that have worked for the last 78 years and say, well, it's better to be controlled and have someone that will uh, come to your rescue when there's any problem, then the whole structure is going to be totally destroyed. That's uh, the fear that uh, is underlying the attention now focusing on how should we deal with China. We, uh, Glenn mentioned uh, the difficulty, domestic difficulty of having US come back to TPP. But you all know that in the last uh, APEC summit meeting, President Xi said uh, they are considering uh, seriously about joining TPP. Now, that opened the door in China to discuss and then seriously study uh, how they would be able to join TPP. One of the incentives that they may have, and this is my personal view, and of course, uh, uh, I, I have no uh, concrete basis to say this, but it may very well be a strategic thinking saying, if you are in TPP before others, then you will be able to make judgments on how the next, next country should be admitted or not. China joining before US, China will be able to veto US to come in to a system that US built. See, this is the kind of uh, uh, thinking that uh, uh, I believe we need to address today before it's too late. And that is the awareness that the US people need to be uh, really thinking because uh, you can't uh, control everything after the fact. South China Sea has now become militarized by Chinese. And how are you going to put it back to the uh, status, status quo ante? Well, it's a fait accompli. And we could criticize that, but it's not going to change things on the ground. And therefore, we still have time. And the Biden administration is a blessing, in my view, to re-engage US constructively in the mind of continue to be the driving engine for global prosperity based on rule-based system and the rule of law, which will be benefiting all individuals. That's why this uh, discussion about China is so important. And in all the meetings that have been held between democracies, including the latest G7, 
the issue with China was always registered in the joint communique that was issued after the meeting. And therefore, we cannot avoid discussing even Japan-US collaboration or how we could uh, continue to work together, keeping in mind how we will be able to bring China into the constructive mode that will benefit them as well. Thanks, Ambassador. Um, I guess I, what I hear, perhaps more subtly than you intend, is a suggestion that China itself is a threat to the rule of law and to multilateral cooperation. Do you intend to say that, uh, or is that, uh, or is it more hopeful than that? Well, uh, if you look very closely on what are the public pronouncements uh, the China Chinese government or the uh, leaders are saying is they re they would like to have UN play a central role in the global affairs and then people respecting international law. So, if you take that at face value, they will they will have to do that themselves, not just ask others to do it because if you don't do it, nobody will do it. And therefore, I do have hopes that uh, with engaging in these legal discussion, for example, although this is not something uh, that was on the agenda for this uh, session, uh, the war of note verbals that are going in UN today, that's legal argument. And China is not just rejecting and uh, uh, ignoring that. They are engaging and try to legitimize and justify what they're doing. Those are the discussions that uh, needs to go on. And because this is also education and enlightening each other on what could be the compromise agreement that can uh, uh, come up. So uh, I am not uh, uh, pessimistic about being able to conduct those discussions. And uh, uh, we certainly be able to do that if only they will come forward with a little more flexibility in the minds uh, not being controlled by the party uh, throughout. Thank you. So we're already starting to get some questions. And as you might expect, there are follow-up questions uh, to the ambassador's suggestion of multilateralizing the US-Japan, what you call a high quality agreement on, on the digital economy. Um, can you, and, and, and Glenn, you're welcome to jump in on this, say more about what multilater multilateralizing that agreement means and how is that agreement specifically uh, different from the EU's approach? And I guess it also ties into what you've said about China. Is there any prospect that that high quality digital agreement could include the agreement of China eventually? Thank you again. That's a very good point, and that is precisely the most difficult point. TPP, in fact, uh, has a very solid uh, chapter on digital trade. Just take one example. Prohibition of uh, su uh, server localization requirement, meaning unless you have uh, you, your data, your uh, communication goes through a server in the host country's territory, you cannot reach out to your consumers or individuals or companies for that matter. Now, that is prohibited under TPP and uh, Japan and US, uh, while we were negotiating TPP, made certain that others would do the same. So look at Vietnam, for example, which is a one party state. They have come to agree that they have to do that. Of course, there are cases where uh, public uh, order exemptions could be uh, raised to uh, control such uh, flow of data, but it is a rule that they have come to accept that uh, data localization is not going to be uh, a requirement for or conducting digital trade. Now, we have those precedents where some of the Asian countries have come on board for that discipline and using that as a platform to expand will be certainly be uh, viable and feasible as well. Of course, it will be much better if everybody comes on to the TPP. Uh, and of course, US perhaps, once the TPP membership expands, 
could see the benefit of U.S. also joining it. But I also have to say that uh, uh, U.S. is the original signatory of TPP. U.S. doesn't have to negotiate coming to TPP. It just has to say, okay, uh, we've agreed. Uh, the document is fixed. We'll just ratify that. If the U.S. Congress or U.S. businesses or leaders say, uh, since we are joining, TPP has to give us more rewards, that's going to be a negotiation, and I don't think that is going to be feasible either. You have to start with being more realistic on what you can do. Ambition is fine, but come in first and then let it grow. That is uh, how I would uh, suggest the approach should be. And we are taking the same approach with other Asian countries that have uh, uh, made certain their interest, Thailand, Philippines, Indonesia as well. So the expansion through TPP, which is a more comprehensive one, not just limited to digital, although digital is what I have been saying, very important, you have to give some benefits where those countries have more strength than others. And TPP is very comprehensive. And that's how the balance can be reached. So as a platform for expanding Asia-Pacific cooperation, TPP is certainly a very, very uh, useful tool. Uh, only if US comes and then agree to push it forward, uh, that will be a significant uh, progress uh, evolving in the uh, Indo-Pacific that we are currently promoting to open and free and then prosperous world. Thank you. Uh, Glenn, is there anything that the ambassador said, especially on the digital uh, issue, uh, that you would like to add or, or, or disagree with? Well, I agree, first of all, on the importance of digital uh, as an issue. I secondly uh, also agree that it would be uh, beneficial for the United States to engage with Japan to and get other Asian countries engaged on the, the digital trade uh, uh, agenda. Um, what I, uh, I guess I have some uh, differences with Koji with regard to uh, his uh, characterization about the U.S. needing to be realistic and basically accept the TPP uh, as, as it is currently constituted and not to uh, ask for any changes. Because I, I think that the view within the United States is that it's already been uh, four or five years since uh, TPP was negotiated. And especially with the current administration's uh, focus on uh, the, uh, the middle class and working class. I think uh, there, and also with the USMCA also having been agreed to since that time, since TPP, I, I don't think that it's um, realistic <laughs> to expect that the administration would uh, accept the TPP as it is now. It would want some changes. And, uh, and as Koji mentioned, uh, that wouldn't be easy. It will require some negotiations with the, the current uh, countries and, and perhaps other members that are going to join. So I, I think that um, I go back to my original uh, comment, which is that it's uh, very difficult to expect that the U.S. will uh, get in, engaged uh, in the near future in the CPTPP. I do think there, there are uh, possibilities on digital uh, economy, but even there, as I mentioned in my opening comments, there are differences, differences of views within the administration. And so that has to be, uh, I think, worked out. One thing, one other thing I'd like to mention is that um, you know, when I was at U.S. here back in the 80s, the, all, all of this, a lot of the, uh, the high-tech issues that the U.S. dealt with were with Japan. And so issues like uh, semiconductors, supercomputers, uh, intellectual property rights protection, um, industrial policy, uh, government subsidies, these were all on the agenda between the U.S. and Japan at that time. Um, some of them, many of them have been resolved, uh, but I think it's quite interesting that now the precise the same issues are, are coming out between the United States and China and also between uh, Japan and China. And I think there really is uh, some fertile ground for the U.S. and Japan to cooperate in these areas. One other final point I'd like to make is we didn't haven't talked about it so far, but I think one of the areas in which the U.S. hopes to uh, engage with Japan for further cooperation is in international organizations and institutions uh, such as the WTO. And uh, I think we've noticed that there's a, a senior Japanese government, government official who has been assigned to uh, assist the uh, head of the WTO. And I think there is some um, uh, optimism and, and uh, hope that the US and Japan can
cooperate to try to strengthen and uh, kind of revive the, the WTO, but not only WTO, but other international organizations and institutions. Right, and I'm get, glad, Glenn, that you raised the WTO because I, I definitely want to address that. But I guess uh, following up what you said, I guess that what you're saying is that uh, even if Hillary Clinton was right in calling the TPP uh, the gold standard uh, way back when, it's no longer the gold standard, uh, at least from the view of some in the U.S. I'm curious, though, as a follow-up, what is exactly uh, what the U.S. would l want to see? Just put it, just indulge us for a second that there is some possibility of movement on among some Republicans and Democrats on this issue. Is it the addition of climate change mitigation? Is it uh, more on protecting labor rights? Is it more on protecting general environmental issues? What do you think the changes might be uh, that the U.S. would insist on uh, for uh, uh, its coming into the TPP? Well, I think you've hit on some of the major issues that uh, the U.S. would want to see some uh, tightening up, some improvements in, in the uh, provisions, certainly on uh, on the environment and climate uh, issues, because that is a, a huge priority of this administration. Uh, and secondly, on, on labor issues. I think there's been a real evolution uh, in the U.S. over the last, even just within the last six years or 10 years, about the importance of labor in the context of uh, international trade. Um, and so those are certainly two major areas. I, I do think also that, uh, that digital uh, I mean, there are so many new developments every year or every week when it becomes a digital that that TPP agreement was, you know, back in the uh, you know, five years ago. Um, and so I think there would be some tightening up of those. So, you know, I, depending on who you ask in the United States, there, there may be different uh, nuances, but those are three areas, uh, labor, environment and uh, digital that I would expect that uh, the U.S. would want to see updating uh, as, as kind of areas that would want that the U.S. would want updated in order to to uh, entertain the possibility of uh, rejoining uh, TPP. So, Ambassador, yeah, uh, uh, yes, uh, you're uh, welcome to address this, uh, but I do want to uh, see if you have something to say about uh, the WTO and yeah. how the U.S. and Japan should approach yeah. that organization. Uh, well, first, on the uh, these three issues that uh, Glenn mentioned, which are relevant, uh, those are being addressed. They, they do have a core uh, chapter addressing those three issues. What I'm saying is TPP is not a static agreement. It can grow if you come in, but you can't change it from outside. This is just logic. When you're joining an organization, you don't change that constitution. Joining UN you're not going to ask the charter to be re amended for you. You can come in and then reform it, but you can't condition your entry for uh, satisfying yourself or your domestic constituency before you take on the commitment to abide by the rule. That's very simple. That's all there is to it. On WTO, I, fu I fully agree, and I my view may not be uh, aligned with the Japanese government official view, I do think WTO needs real reform. Uh, and the real reform is even a uh, wide difference between US and Euro Europe, EU. The EU tendency in the last 10 to 10 years or so has been to bring in the judicial proceeding process in resolving commercial disputes. It's a mismatch. You don't spend 10 years. Glenn may have a good view on that because he was both Boeing and Airbus representative in Japan. You see, uh, 10 years it, and then still not effective. Uh, who is going to use that sort of uh, dispute settlement mechanism when business interests have to wait uh, before any decision is handed out. It doesn't work. That's why uh, when I was uh, uh, doing Uruguay Round, I did not believe the appellate body is necessary because it takes too, too much time. And of course, uh, if uh, you don't think uh, a dispute settlement is effective, nobody's going to use it. So it's going to be uh, a, a, a paper castle, no, nothing. 
you see, you have to have an effective enforcement mechanism when you set up rules. Unfortunately, uh, being effective, of course, you have to be fair, you have to be transparent and legitimate. The Europeans believe the judicial process is the one that does it. And they, are no, they have no regard to uh, the, the commercial interest that is going to be only alive maybe one or two years. And if there's no corrected measures within those time, only the giants will survive and the small ones will never come up. And that is going to kill the global market, which is now having all companies of all sizes, small and medium, engaged, which is going to uh, lighten up and then uh, uh, a, a prosper all the global economy. So first thing Japan and US need to agree on, we both belong to the new world. We are not old world. We need to address the realities and realities is how you address the unfair competitive edge that has been created by state intervention, for example. And it will be a one-shot operation and the companies will survive. You can do it again if you still see problems, but don't put it into a 10-year negotiating, which is not really a dispute settlement process. So, Glenn, uh, do you have a different view on the priority the Biden administration should allocate to reactivating the WTO appellate body? Um, as you know, there's some attention in the administration uh, to doing that. Um, do you agree with what the ambassador said about that? Well, I personally am very much of the view that with regard to uh, WTO as well as TPP, that the U.S. should devote much more attention to these. And so I'm one of those who, who uh, personally... Uh, I, but I, I've been in this program, I've been basically trying to ex explain the, the administration's thinking on these issues. But I personally would very much favor the U.S. Uh, putting uh, more attention, more resources into uh, cooperating with like-minded countries. And I agree with Koji that the U.S. and Japan have some a lot of similarities with regard to what we would like to see in the WTO. And there are significant differences between the United States and the EU, and also significant differences with China. And so. I think there's fertile ground for the U.S. and Japan to cooperate. And, and personally, I find it frustrating that there isn't uh, a more aggressive uh, initiative on the part by the administration uh, on these issues on international trade. However, I can also understand that at the same time, because of the divisions within the United States, uh, whether it's on economic policy or whether it's on uh, political issues, and as we're going through the debates right now within the United States about infrastructure and about the families plan. I mean, so I think it's understandable to the US that the administration will focus first and foremost on the domestic economy and try to get our house in order and try to make sure that we are competitive and based on that uh, engage with uh, these uh, international agreements. Now Koji would probably argue that we should do both simultaneously. And I agree personally, but I think as a matter of um, of um, resources and, and, and attention, I think there's just too much to deal with, whether it's the pandemic, whether it's uh, economic issues, whether it's uh, inequalities, Black Lives Matter, climate change. Uh, there are so many issues that it's understandable that the administration would focus first and foremost on the domestic issues. But I hope personally that we will engage much more with WTO and CPP and other, uh, TPP and other international agreements. Well, um, there have a few questions here on the uh, Q&A uh, and chat boxes. One of them is from Catherine uh, Wilhelm, our director, uh, who points out that China has, in the past few years, approved very comprehensive domestic legislation on data localization. Uh, it's well known what it's doing with Didi, the car uh, hire company, uh, with respect to its IPO in New York, uh, and other data concerns are an example. The Chinese government has demonstrated that it will accept a very high cost in order to enforce data localization. Um, so I think she's suggesting that it's a non-starter uh, to expect that China will join anything like the TPP or the uh, high quality US-Japan arrangement. Uh, any comment on that, either of you? Well, I haven't been okay. very optimistic about China joining in the short term because of the high standards that are going to be required. So, but, but I do think that 
I think there are probably some people in China who would like that to happen, but I, I don't think that the leadership of China is prepared at this point to make the kind of concessions necessary to meet those standards. So I, I don't anticipate in the near future that China would, would engage uh, in, in such a, a uh, arrangement. Ambassador? Uh, yes, uh, uh, Glenn has a point, uh, but uh, if you look uh, uh, at this issue from a different perspective of how joining TPP could transform uh, the Chinese domestic structure of uh, economy, uh, once they uh, satisfy all the conditions on the rules part of uh, uh, TPP, uh, the economy will become a free market economy that will not be controlled by the state. And uh, I don't know what was uh, thinking behind uh, President Xi when uh, he said uh, in the APEC summit, and uh, this is public statement, that they are serious consider seriously considering to join TPP. Uh, if uh, they are indeed very serious about doing it, uh, they will come up with proposals perhaps, or just like US, they may be thinking that because China is so big now, the others, uh, the CPP signatories and uh, members will uh, bend the rules for China's admission, perhaps. I don't know. But uh, if we do one bending, we'll have to do two to the others, and then maybe uh, the whole rule will be uh, evaporating. So we can't do that. that but I uh, don't have to be pessimistic and then saying it cannot be done. What I would like to say is that, yes, please, come in. Uh, and then uh, study it. Uh, and in fact, when we were negotiating among the, us, the 12, including US, uh, at the minister's level or chief negotiator's level, there were two countries that uh, uh, were following the negotiation very closely, even by dispatching representatives of uh, those two countries to follow what were going on. And those were China and ROK. U, U, UK, of course, didn't come because they were part of the EU at the time. Uh, but now UK is the first one to say they would like to join. Now we'll see who comes next. China, if they come next, uh, it will absorb a lot of energy on the side of the CPTPP members. But it will be a worthwhile work to do because once you have China in, it will be a major change for the whole package as well as for the Chinese economy. RCEP. Uh, Professor Alvarez, thank you for raising that. Uh, does have those uh, 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 chapters as well, but it allows uh, avoiding taking uh, mandatory measures because uh, it is by choice whether they will abide by the high standards that is enshrined in RCEP. TPP does not allow that. There are some that could be uh, put uh, into a staged uh, implementation, meaning you do, can do it over two, two, three, or five years. But uh, some of the rules that are very important has to be up, uh, about, uh, has to be implemented and respected at the time of entry. So these are things perhaps uh, those who are not inside did not know. Uh, but then even learning what those means uh, is going to be a, a very informative exercise. And by engaging more extensively with the anticipation that countries will come in is going to be in itself a very beneficial work to enlighten both sides of where we are. And that, that is the exercise that I think we need to continue on, not to have a preset of mind, this cannot be done, or that is uh, impossible. Well, I, no, uh, I, don't, uh, I don't have a closed mind about it, but I am... A uh, rather skeptical, at least in the short term. And I'm kind of surprised to hear Koji being as optimistic or as positive as he is about the prospects of uh, China joining and being able to meet the standards. And one thinks about WTO accession by China, uh, there may be some lessons uh, to be learned. And uh, I, don't, I don't frankly know how, how this would be a topic for another conversation, but, uh, but I do think that uh, both the notion of uh, the standards being changed to um, adjust to, to China's requirements uh, or whether China will abide by 
the uh, uh, agreements that it, it makes are, are two issues that need uh, further discussion. So uh, I, we're, we're, we're almost... TPP. You see, uh, just one thing. Uh, you, uh, please, Glenn, study TPP before you mention those because once you are in, you will be subject to dispute settlement measures that are going to be very tough and enforceable and timely and quickly, okay? So it, it is not uh, to doubt whether they will do it. The, the, the expectation that rules could be bent for one country is none. There's not going to be that. Uh, so that is where we are, and I understand your skepticism, but isn't it better for them to come in than keep it out? So um, we're, uh, we're at the end, but I can't resist. There's one uh, patient uh, question on intangible tech transfer uh, uh, in the high tech area, uh, especially on the part of China. Um, it, do any of you have a quick response to the question in the Q&A on how, uh, if any way there can be to address this idea that China is forcing tech transfer, um, not just on its own companies, but on others. Either a very quick word on that. Well, well if you look at RCEP, uh, I think RCEP was able to move at least one step forward that uh, state control over investment has to be disciplined and restrained. Uh, that, that Again, it uh, was the best we could do at that time, but I think it's a step forward. And when uh, China will realize that uh, foreign investment with uh, high-tech uh, in the, uh, technology transfer is going to benefit them, they are not going to continue to coerce and force, hopefully. Well, that remains to be seen. But we need to make certain that the companies do not uh, allow those high techs to be coerced and then given up with no rewards. Because many companies in the past, just to get into the market, were willing to do that. See, it is not state control, but it, it was commercial interest that they saw. If in exchange they could market access, they'd be happy to do that. But that's bad habit. See, bad precedence is going to lead to another. As I said, you, you do it once, you'll be asked to do it twice, and then it's the end. You can't do it. It's a very important issue, but it's a very difficult issue to police and monitor and to make sure that uh, it's uh, uh, reduced, minimized. It, it, it will require not only you know, monitoring, detection, uh, producing evidence, and, uh, and then having a dispute resolution and you know who's going to decide on the resolution of the dispute, and uh, and very often, <clears throat> I mean, harking back a little bit to what Koji was saying about WTO, very often these procedures take so much time that by the time there's a conclusion reached that the party has been harmed, the other party has already benefited from it, uh, and and sometimes in one in some cases driven out the uh, the company that provided the technology. So it's a very very important but very difficult issue, and there has to be some pretty tight. Uh, mechanisms in order to uh, prevent it. Well, thank you both for uh, a wonderful discussion that will hopefully tee up more discussions. This is only the first of what I suspect will be many interventions on uh, U.S.-Japan trade relations and more generally, uh, how do we conceive of institutions like the WTO and treaties like uh, trade, uh, the, trade, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I can't help at the end to raise uh, two questions that, that um, not for our speakers, but just that came up in this discussion that come up repeatedly in classes here at NYU. And, uh, and I see some differences between our two speakers on these issues. So one of them is how do we think of a treaty like the TPP? Um, I think there's a tendency in members of Congress uh, and on others to see it as a contract uh, with particular terms, one shot in time. There is a tendency by others, and I think the ambassador reflects that idea, that treaties these days, especially one like that one, is a dynamic lawmaking process that's more like the constitution of an organization, and that the commitment is less to the existing rules in the contract 
than to committing yourself to an organization and to changing those rules over time. Uh, those are two competing views of what a treaty is. And I think different countries have different views and different treaties may take on one or more of the others. But that's an issue that comes up repeatedly in international law courses here. The other issue that I think was also teed up today was the role of international dispute settlers. Uh, on the one hand, you can see them as advancing the ball by judicial creativity, which I think the ambassador is suggesting the Europeans view of the WTO, but also the, the push for, for example, a multilateral investment court, that therefore the adjudicators are making the rules in the course of dispute settlement. But that's precisely been the problem as seen by the Trump administration with the WTO. And one of the reasons that even the Obama administration uh, pushed back against uh, appellate body members was the perception that uh, they have no business making rules before the rules are actually negotiated, including on things like uh, 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 countervailing measures and dumping. Uh, and that's a tension. How much should we rely on negotiating the rules ex ante versus delegating that to adjudicators to make over time? Uh, I don't think we have clear answers to that, but those are two big ticket items that I think you heard uh, in the discussions today. I thank both of our speakers uh, for a wonderful discussion. I look forward to welcoming both of them uh, uh, back uh, to you, Sally, uh, oh, a few months from now as we see where Biden, uh, where uh, Japan is on all of these issues. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much.